evening, everyone. Hello um, and welcome to the second of our Rugby Safe webinars um, around wellbeing. Um, we're hosting this in partnership with Simply Health, the RFU's trusted healthcare provider. My name is Rachel Paul Brown. I'm a player welfare manager for the community game at the RFU. And just to say from, from me, a massive thank you for joining us either tonight live or if you're watching this on demand as well. Before we get started and I introduce uh, my guests tonight, um, I'm just going to do a little bit of housekeeping uh, just to make sure that you're, you're set up for, for the, the webinar. So hopefully you can hear and see it's okay. If you're not, please text, test your connection. Uh, there's a little button that says test your connection. If you click on that, that'll explain it and hopefully you'll, you'll uh, be able to, to join us pretty soon having got that sorted. Also, there should be a little box saying chat box. Um, so please open that up and feel free to join in the chat and ask any questions. And I'll try to pick these up and ask them to Dylan and or David as we go through. Um, and also, obviously, there's the video screen. Um, and if you want to open that up to have on, on full, there's the usual little square that you can maximise and minimise as you so wish. Um, as I mentioned, this is the second webinar uh, we are hosting with um, kind of the mental health and well-being theme. Um, and in this one, we're really going to focus on, on clubs and what they can do to support the well-being of players and members and create those kind of cultures. And joining me tonight, we've got Dylan Hartley and David Beanie. So um, on a rugby webinar, Dylan, I don't think you really need any introduction, but I'll, I'll do a little bit anyway. So uh, Dylan is England's most capped hooker and a Grand Slam winning captain and someone who's used to, to pressure on the pitch. However, he was also a young man who moved away from home um, and is a family man, father of two, with dailies up, to, up and downs uh, that entails um, a professional career transitioning into a new life following injury. Um, and having just spoken with Dylan before we went live, it's been a long day for you, Dylan. So we're uh, fresh and ready to go for this, but... Uh, Every day's a long day. Every, Every day's, day's a long, long day. day. You've got children, don't you worry. <laughs> well, yeah, definitely. I agree with you there. Probably longer um, than my wife, who's downstairs wrestling the children to bed right now. <laughs> yeah, we both just say we've both got kids uh, hope in the going to bed stage, so we'll apologise now for any background noise. Um, and David, David Beanie, David suffered for over 30 years, not wanting to tell his colleagues or employer that he was battling with mental health problems, believing that it would damage his career. He was also embarrassed and scared of the potential consequences. Through his company, Breaking the Silence, David now uses his experience to implement mental health and wellbeing strategies within the workplace. Um, and David's obviously here to help share that experience and how we can utilise it within rugby clubs. David's committed the rest of his life to working uh, to reducing the stigma around mental health. Uh, evening, David. How are you doing? I'm doing good. And I'll just say my kids are 29 and 27 and they still give me long days. So um, once you've got kids, you're stuck with it for life. Trust me. <laughs> I look forward to the many years ahead. Um, so um, before we kind of get into to the discussions and questions tonight, we just want to see who's joining us on on the webinar. So we've got a couple of quick polls um, that I'm just going to set off. So the first one is we just want to know what your primary role is. So hopefully that should be popping up on your screen now. So if you can just have a go at completing that, just press whichever one you deem to be as your kind of primary role within rugby. OK, so um, I'll publish these. So people can see what's going on. Um, so we've generally got a good percentage of rugby safe leads, which is really good. Um, you know, this was kind of targeted at that audience. So it's great to know that we've, we've got that. We've also got a good 25 percent of other club volunteers as well. A few coaches um, and a few uh, parents and, and others on there as well. So great to have you all joining tonight. Next one. Uh, so just want to know what, what split we've got in terms of gender. So again, just, um, just answer that one for us. OK, 
Okay, fairly even split, which is really good. Again, I'll just share that. So literally, we've got 52% uh, men and uh, 50, 47 women. So nice even split on that one. And then final question, again, just kind of age categories as well, just so we, we've got an idea of who we've got from uh, across the, the age spectrum. So mainly, mainly people in their mid to late 40s, early 50s, and then kind of a nice mix across the others as well. So it's good to see that we've got a good range of people on tonight. Um, great. So we're going to move into some questions tonight. The way we're going to structure it tonight, a little bit different to, for those of you who attended the last one, a little bit different uh, this evening. I'm going to basically pose a few questions to, to Dylan and David, um, and they'll obviously uh, answer questions. If you've got any uh, questions yourself, feel free, as we mentioned before, to pop them in the chat box and I'll try and monitor them and pick them up as we go. So um, first one, really, we're obviously, as, as we mentioned, we're going to focus on clubs and what they can do in, the, in, in sorry, excuse me, start again. We're going to focus on clubs and what they can do to have, um, have in place to support players, such as having open and positive cultures um, and promoting that. You know, it's a real key part of it. So Dylan... As a team captain, what steps would you take to, to try and notice if players were struggling with their mental health? What kind of things might you have looked to identify? I think this is this is really interesting because I, I was almost spoiled as a captain in terms of professional environment. I've got contact. I spent more time with my teammates than I did my family. So effectively, I, I knew my teammates very well. Um, so clear signs of people struggling were fairly obvious. And I, I think this is where... Um, a, a leader within your, your grassroots club or a captain or anyone at a grassroots club, you only got people for a snapshot of their day. So, you know, people work all day and they come along to training, unpack the bag, get their kit on, train, then go home. So it's, it's almost knowing your people. And this is, again, where you earn your, your, your bread as a captain, I think. It's not what you effectively do on the field. It's what you do off it. It's knowing your people, knowing those telltale signs. And do you know what? You, you, can, you can spread yourself too thin worrying about a lot of people and you can't cover every base. So this is where your sort of network or tentacles within your team. Um, you, you need trusted people that uh, that know these people better than yourself that say, I've noted this or I know they're going through this. You know, I, I dealt with many a thing in, in my teams from, you know, girlfriends, boyfriends breaking up to divorces, you know, problems at home to miscarriage to, to funerals, all these sorts of things. And the wider team never knew, but if a friend of that player would come up and say, I just want to let you know, or the player himself, or sometimes you could even spot that player, I think the first step is just checking in on that person. Hey, yeah. I heard about this, or I've noticed this. Are you okay? And then there's a process to that, you know. Um, one, once you, you know what they're going through, you can help them navigate through that. And um, again, you're, de you're dealing with personalities. Everyone's different. Some people want to be treated as normal. Some people may need... Um, um, almost a, a bit of a, a, a free pass when it comes to the changing room sort of banter. But I think as long as your, 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 your teammates are aware, ultimately, or you as a captain are aware of what's going on, you can help navigate that situation. That's great. And you've alluded to some of this already, but how would you potentially approach a team member if they were hesitant about actually coming forward and asking for help? You know, you can see that they're struggling, but they don't want to actually ask. How might you, have you ever had that? How might you approach it? I think... Um, Again, there's no easy way to do it. You have to be, in my experience, I would be direct. I would say I've noticed this. But I think the key thing with it is is timing. You know, yeah. Do it in a private setting. Do it after training when kind of people have dispersed and it's a little bit quieter when they're heading to the car park. Catch them at a time where, you know, they're not put in a public situation where they've got to put a front on. Um, and I think that the sort of tone of your voice and your approach um, just be tactile about these things. And do you know what? I'm only speaking from experience, but I think timing of that conversation is, is key. Brilliant. Thanks, Dylan. And, and David, thinking about some of the things that Dylan said there, 
Um, how can developing initiatives that support mental health and well-being benefit rugby clubs? What's kind of, you know, what's the real benefit to them? The benefit to rugby clubs, if you get your well-being right, will be seen on and off the pitch. Um, when you create a kind of culture in any organisation, your best people don't leave. Um, less people go off, off, off sick with stress type issues and people generally become more engaged. When, when you create a kind of culture, it, it's, it's not a fluffy subject. When people are happier, they, they, they're more themselves and they're more likely to perform at their very best. Um, Rachel, I'd, I'd love you to do that poll if possible that we've, we've done about could, would people yeah. feel safe to talk about their mental health in their rugby club? Give me two secs. I will find my poll. There we go. So next one. There we go. Uh, so that should have cut, that should pop up now. So yeah, we're basically asking how would you feel um, or would you feel comfortable sharing your true mental health within your rugby club? And as Dylan mentioned there, it could be to a teammate. It could be to, you know, someone in a, in a volunteer position. It could be your coach. Uh, just the, uh, yeah, who, um, would you feel comfortable going in and actually saying, look, this is this is where I'm at? OK, I'll, I'll publish those just to share them. So really positively, uh, uh, David, 75 so percent saying yes. So that's that, that's that's really good. Do you know what? That's that's brilliant. You know, I work in, in the corporate sector every day and it's nowhere near 75 percent. So I'm really encouraged that people feel they can talk about their, their mental health in, in, in their rugby clubs. Um, in terms of what, what rugby clubs need to do to create kinder cultures, just like the business world, Rachel, the, the tone has to come from the top of the rugby club. You yeah. need the most senior people in the rugby clubs being prepared to talk about where mental health has touched their lives. Lots of them won't have their own mental health story like I've got, but um, it will have touched their life somewhere. And when, when senior people in the rugby clubs, the people who run these clubs, uh, the top coaches and so on, when they talk openly about their mental health, they're giving other people permission to talk about their, their mental health too. I, I do a lot of work with the Royal Navy and I'm trying to help them to get rid of their macho culture to make it easier for sailors to open up and talk about their well-being. And what we've done in the Navy, we've got some very top admirals, some really senior people in the Navy to, to openly share where, where they've been challenged with their mental health. And it's created what I call um, I'm Spartacus moments, because the moment they start talking about mental health, they make it easier for everyone to talk about this subject. And, and suddenly it's, it's not a taboo subject anymore. Um, what, what's great about you know, this pandemic, if there is some great things about it, is that it's become more acceptable to say, I'm, you know, I'm not OK at the moment, I, I'm struggling. So uh, that, that, is, that is brilliant to hear. Um, it used to be regarded as weakness to talk about your mental health. When you get more people in rugby clubs talking about it, um, when you share vulnerabilities, you inspire other people to share vulnerabilities too. Um, it, it's no longer weak to talk about this subject. So, uh, but that's brilliant that 75% of the people on here tonight feel they could talk about mental health in their rugby clubs. That, that's brilliant to see. Yeah, definitely. And, and I know kind of doing work in this area at the moment, there's definitely that increase in terms of people feeling more open and right across the club. You know, as you mentioned, there, people having those conversations. And I guess following on to that, you know, we, you mentioned the kind of cultures there, David. So creating those kind of cultures is really going to rely on awareness and understanding. And it's that buy in across the club, as, we, as we've just spoken about there. I guess, Dylan, from a player perspective and in your, and in your experience, what might be the best way to address the situation if there's a player who's actually probably not buying into it and actually maybe creating a bit of discomfort for other, team, other members of the team? Is there anything that you could, you could suggest there? Again, um, the way I deal with things is, is just direct and, and head on, pretty much like the way that I played. Um, not overly complicated, direct, sometimes got myself in trouble, but I always felt I was fairly honest. Um, but yeah, it, I think if you've got that awareness about your squad and how people are feeling, what's going on at home, what's going on in their lives, you know, you can make those. Because, do you know what, kind of cultures, I think we've got to tread lightly or tiptoe around this or not confuse it with changing the dynamic of a rugby club. 
especially the social dynamic of a rugby club, which is a very special place. Like the 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 humour that can sometimes come at a rugby club, the uh, the different personalities that you get. I don't think we want to change that. We want to just make people aware of other people, basically. Um, what am I trying to say? I'm just saying I don't think that every rugby club needs an overhaul. I think we just need a greater awareness of these things going on. And do you know what? I, I kind of said about the snapshot in a person's day. You get people turning up training. I think the, the more we you can do as a rugby club and getting people staying for food afterwards, staying for drinks, because we all know that's that's where things are shared. There's not time on the training field to talk about what's going on at home. But once you shower and you go for some food, sit down for a drink, that is where you talk, around a table, over a pint potentially. And you know, as soon as you talk, that's where problems are shared and solutions are kind of put forward. And that's where friends can rally around each other. So I think a greater awareness. Um, I don't want to... Um, contradict what David's saying, but a kind of culture at a rugby club isn't an overhaul of what the rugby club is now. Because rugby clubs are bloody kind places. There's a lot of generous people, but I think a greater awareness of people's personal lives, what's going on in their heads, their lives at home, whatnot, is is definitely on the rise and something we need to keep pushing. I, I do agree with what, what Dylan's saying, that there's not an overhaul needed. It, it's a little more conversation. It's finding a little bit more time for each other. Um, HSBC Bank, very different to a, to a rugby club. Uh, they're considered one of the best employers in the world, but they got a big shock about four years ago when they did a survey of their staff, which involved 76,000 employees. And one of the questions in the survey was, do we care about you, yes or no? And, and they got a big kick up the backside because... 38,000 employees said, no, this organization doesn't care about me. When they drilled into the data, they wanted to understand what was going on. And it was really simple stuff. And number one was um, in your one-to-one -one meetings, people were going straight in to talk about work as opposed to saying, hi, Dylan, how are you doing? And that was all that was going wrong. So with, within any organization, whether it's a, a rugby club or a business, we want more people saying to you, hi, Dylan, how are you doing? And not just asking the question, listen, just checking in with each other. And as Dylan said, get, getting to know each other more as people, getting to know if they've got kids or, you know, what their passions are away from away from the uh, the club itself. So, uh, yeah, I, I don't think overhauls are needed. I just think it's just a bit more checking in with each other and becoming even more social. Thanks. Yeah, no, it's a really good point, David. And just on that, you know, you sort of said not necessarily overhaul it might be minor little tweaks and just little things and changes of approach and behavior one of those things could be around sort of language and, and managing those conversations whether it be speaking to someone who's maybe kind of causing a bit of discomfort to other people or who you know we need to kind of support so is there any have you got any tips or thoughts around those kind of those kind of conversations and the language we use david yeah can i can we do the the last poll rachel can we just ask people yeah. their scores out of 10 because uh, yeah, it's very it. much related to this this topic. Yeah, hold so, on um, two seconds. I'll get that one up. So, so last you... last poll question. Sorry, go for it. I was just going to say for those listening at the moment about this poll, um, don't get hung up on it too much. It, let, let's call it your energy levels this evening. Just uh, one to ten. We all understand that language. Um, we're not going to come to any of you individually and ask you why you scored what you scored. So, uh, yeah, back, sorry, back to you, Rachel. No, it's fine. Give it. We'll give it a second just to for people to. So generally, uh, we've got nothing below five, which is is good. So twenty seven percent five to six, uh, a good fifty five percent seven to eight, and then we've got some. Um, People are feeling really good, and 16% of people are, are in that 9 to 10 category. You're okay. welcome, everyone. You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> We've just made their day. That's what it is. <laughs> uh, just, just coming back onto the language you use around this topic, the, the irony is, is I spend my life going around saying we've got to get better at talking about mental health. The worst thing you can say to anyone is, I'm worried about your mental health. We don't like that word mental. It, it's too invasive. Now, the reason I just got us to do that poll 
is because we all understand the language of one to 10. We all know seven's okay. We know eight or nine's pretty good. And we know anything under seven could be a bit better. Now, when you ask people regularly, what you'll find is most of your mates generally give the same score. You've always got the mate who's 10 out of 10. Someone else is always nine. Someone else is always eight. It's quite subjective. But if you ask people regularly, you're looking for variation. So if, if every time I asked Dylan how he was, he was an eight out of 10, and one day he was only a five, it creates an opportunity for me to say, Dylan, mate, you're normally an eight. Why are you only a five? And because you're using the language of numbers, it's, uh, it's a very easy way to open up a conversation. I had a mother contact me recently and she said, David, thank you so much. After your session the other day, I asked my daughter how happy she was out of 10. And the way she responded led to the most honest and open conversation we've ever had about her well-being because we were using the language of numbers. So it's a very easy way to check in with people at rugby clubs by just getting people to give you a score out of 10. But what you're looking for is variation. Also, in terms of language you use, um, one of the most difficult things is to go up to someone and, and not make them feel awkward if you're worried about their well-being. And you, you generally feel pretty uncomfortable, too. Now, as a mental health counsellor, we're trained to notice, not interpret. What you tend to do with mates is interpret behaviour. And that leads to people feeling judged. And nobody likes to feel judged. But if you notice a change in behaviour, it's factual. So if Dylan was normally really easygoing and mild mannered, and he started biting my head off recently, I could say to him, Dylan, um, I've noticed recently you've become a real moody bear. You've become really bloody aggressive. Um, that's not normally like you. Um, do you mind me asking what, what, what you know, what, what, what's going on at the moment? Because I've noticed this change in you. And because I've noticed it and I've not interpreted it, he's far more likely to tell me what's going on in his life at the moment. So notice, don't interpret is a good way to open up conversations. And just one more. Some of you might have seen the Roman Kemp documentary recently about a month ago on TV that was bloody brilliant. And a real simple bit of advice that came out of that program. Um, if you go up to someone and ask them how they are, they normally say fine, but ask them a second time. With a smile on your face, say to somebody, and now how are you really? And you might get a different response the second time. So also consider that way in terms of trying to open people up. Uh, thanks, Rachel. Yeah, some really good little ideas there that can be, you know, you don't have to have some all singing or dancing kind of initiative just to kind of implement implement those things. So so thanks for that, David. Um, just, uh, just thinking, I guess, kind of focusing in on something else here. So there are a number of factors, as we've discussed, that can contribute to an, an individual's mental health and well-being. In most cases, in, in a community rugby setting, that these factors will probably be outside of rugby. Um, however, in within rugby, injury is, is one factor that actually could play quite a significant part on, on someone's kind of mental well-being. So Dylan, again, kind of thinking it, at it from a player's point of view, and obviously having been injured yourself, what do you feel you miss out on and how does that affect your mental well-being um, you know, when, when you're injured? I think, uh, again, there's two different kind of sides to it here. Professionally, I, I truly believe that I've, I've experienced both sorts of styles of management. When I was injured, I had to attend every kind of meeting, every training session you're watching. And then on top of that, you're attending physio sessions, which are usually at the start of the day and the end of the day, because the middle of the day is for the talent, the team that's playing at the weekend. So being injured in, in a professional environment wasn't always a pleasant place, wasn't always a, an easy place to recover and get better. And then in my last couple of years at Change of Management, um, the coach basically said, attend whatever you want, don't attend what you want, and focus on yourselves in terms of getting better. So I think a conversation like that is the best. We still want you here, but if it's easier for you to deal with your injury um, and focus on your rehab instead of having to watch training and attend games and all this sort of stuff. You know, your priority is to get your body better, get your get back so you're ready to play. If that means you want to be here at training, watching, participating, um, doing analysis, whatever that may be, do that. But if your your headspace needs to be focused on 
on yourself, go and do that. But the, the one non-negotiable for that program was every Monday morning, David, you touched on this, we had basically an alignment meeting. So everyone that was injured, all departments, everyone kind of met in the auditorium. It was a bit of like a network catch up and we didn't talk anything rugby. We had a quick sitting of the, the scene for the week. Everyone shook hands, everyone sees each other, haven't seen you all week or haven't seen you in two weeks. And that sort of meeting to keep people connected and in touch with each other at least once a week was was fairly key. So I think, um, especially at a grassroots level, if you've got injured players, the one thing I would do is try and provide a physio clinic on one of your evening sessions. On a Tuesday or Thursday, there are so many trainees, interns, people out there. There must be a physio local to your club that wants to set up a free clinic, you know, free rent for an evening. You could do subsidized um, strapping, massage, rehab, things like that, just to get people coming to the rugby club and staying connected. Because the last thing you want with your injured players is them going off down Virgin Active by themselves or the terrorist townhouse physio where they're in the drawing room getting their ankle fixed. Um, you want them at the rugby club. You want people to stay connected. So there's one little solution there. Uh, I think I touched on that last time, again, with the, the PT side of things. Um, get, get a personal trainer renting the field down at the club. So if guys can't do rugby training, but they, they want to do some style of fitness, there's a facility there for them. It's just another idea. Sorry, I've gone yeah, on for a bit there. No, it's fine. I wouldn't expect anything less. And other, by the way, other gyms are available as well. But um, yeah, no, I think it's a really good point. And, and actually what you said there is really good, you know, what you've experienced in the in your professional ex, um, career is something that can be applied that slightly more come down you know as you feel and even if they can't you know club isn't able to provide a physio just come down and be part of training you know ha stand next to the coach and have a chat and or just you know be in the clubhouse or whatever but just come down and have a bit of social rather than you know if, if a player's out for four or five weeks and doesn't come down at all it can be quite isolating and and you know they can feel quite removed from the club so David, on that, you know, is there anything else you can you can sort of add to that in terms of club supporting injured players? Yeah, let me let me talk about two different types of injury: one a physical injury and one a mental health injury. If I tell you what traditionally happens in the working world, and uh, this is what mustn't never happen in rugby clubs. Let's say, for example, on the same day, um, Dylan sadly broke his leg, and Rachel, you were signed off with. Um, some sort of mental health issue, um, some sort of work-related stress. Traditionally in the, in, in the working community, you, you're about to go on very different journeys, although you've gone off sick on the same day. Um, Dylan, um, within a couple of days, um, he will, um, he'll get a card signed by everyone from the business, a lot of them taking the piss out of him for breaking his leg. Um, his mates will be ringing him up, texting him. He will get lots and lots of communication. And uh, the good news for Dylan, he knows when his physio starts. He roughly knows when his injury is going to be over and uh, he knows when he can start playing again. So if he's broken his leg and he's pissed off, he's, uh, he's not in too bad a place, really. Um, Rachel, you've never felt like this before and you never, ever thought you'd feel like this. You've, you've been signed off and, and, you, and you've gone away and you're feeling very low. You're in a worse place than Dylan. But strangely enough, you don't get a card with people taking the piss out of you. You don't get phone calls. You don't get texts because people decide that the best thing to do with Rachel because it's mental health is to leave you alone and just let you get on with it. Because the last thing Rachel wants to do is hear from all of us lot. You're in far need of comfort and support than Dylan, but we give all the support to Dylan. Let's let's fast forward six weeks. You both come back to, to work on the same day. Dylan comes back to a hero's reception. He can't walk into the, into the business or the rugby club without people asking him about his leg. If, if he's still in plaster, people are going to sign it. You're dreading coming back. You're really worried that you're going to be looked at and treated differently. And guess what? You are. People care about you as much as they care about Dylan, but they don't know what to say to you because it's mental health. So they end up saying nothing at all. You've come back thinking people are going to, uh, as I say, look at you differently and, uh, and everything. And they do because they just don't know what to say to you. So 
I say to the rugby community this evening, think about different types of injuries. And if anyone ever goes away from your rugby club for a while because they've got challenges with their mental health, try and promise yourself that you'll have as much communication with them as if they had a physical health injury. Um, yes, you have to respect individuals. And sometimes someone does say, look, you know, uh, can, can you leave me alone for, for a week? You have to try and respect their own feelings. But you've got to give support, emotional support to people, whether they've got a physical injury or a mental injury. So I just thought I'd touch on that, Rachel, if that's OK, because um, hopefully that's given some people food for thought. No, it's, it's really, really powerful and, you know, really poignant in terms of, yeah, it's, I think that the story you've, you've, you've kind of played out there is, is, is really good. And it, it does highlight actually the fact that, yes, in rugby, we talk a lot about physical injuries, but being aware of that, that mental side as well and is, is really important. Um, obviously, we've so far, we've kind of mainly focused on looking at the well-being, the mental well-being of players. Um, but, you know, we know that clubs, you know, clubs are a place for many different people into, you know, in terms of players, uh, coaches, other volunteers, retired players, match officials. You know, it's a, a, a place where many different people have many different roles. And based on that, Dylan, you know, having worked with a number of different coaches and support, support staff over your career, do you have any learnings from them in terms of how they approach maintaining their own positive mental well-being? Yeah, I mean, it, we're all humans, right? It doesn't matter if you're a coach, uh, chairman of the club, treasurer, um, you help out behind the bar or you play, you know, you, you're all humans. So one thing I learned is um, one of one of Eddie's sort of um, advisors, a guy called Neil Craig, who's who's near enough Eddie's age, Australian guy as well. He came up to me one day and he goes, "Mate, do do you know that? Um, do you ever think about Eddie how he deals with things?" And I'd never thought about that because when, when you've got your head coach and I suppose as a captain, everyone looks to you as the example. Everyone needs someone to talk to, and I, the, the kind of penny drop there that. Eddie talked to Neil, you know, about his, you know, I'm not saying he doubts himself, but all coaches must doubt themselves. Are they sending the right messages? Are they coaching in a good way? Everyone needs someone to talk to. And equally, he, he said, you know, as a captain, your, your job is to be the example. You know, um, I, I learned this from an early age. You know, if I'm tired, the team's tired. If I'm hungry, the team's hungry. If it's cold, you know, I'm not cold. Otherwise, everyone's cold. And the same thing with a coach. After a loss, you've got to front up and you've got to put your shoulders back, lift your head up, and you've got to have almost that stoic um, power forward, you know, looking forward, positive attitude. But behind the scenes for, to, to enable you to do that, you need to be talking to someone. You need to be reassuring yourself. And equally, like this actually made me laugh, you know, how do you know Eddie hadn't had an argument with his wife that morning, you know? Every, everyone's human. Everyone's got to talk to someone. So my one takeaway from that is it doesn't matter who you are, how old you are, everyone should be talking to someone. You know what I mean? It just uh, it, it gives you confidence in what you're doing or it can give you a solution to a problem, give you reassurance. Um, you know, it doesn't even have to be in a negative context, even in a positive light. How did that go today? What did you think of that? Could we do this better? So you know what? Just talk. Everyone's just got to talk. Find someone you can trust as well, you know? Definitely. And you can be yeah. as open uh, as you want to be that way. And and based on what we were saying earlier, you know, in most cases, there will be people within a club that you can trust and talk to, you know, whether it be mates or coaches or coaches speaking with coaches. So, so you know, that's one of the strengths, as we've mentioned earlier, of, of, of a rugby club, isn't it? Um it's, and, sorry, well, just just quickly, it's not a given though. You know, you can't just create yeah. that overnight. You just can't wish it up. It's it's like anything. You you have to work and invest time and trust in in that relationship for you to be as open and as possible. You know, so um, it starts every Tuesday, every Thursday, every Saturday. Um, you know, just building those conversations, showing those vulnerabilities, asking for that feedback, good, bad. You know, giving that feedback, good, bad. Is is open those lines can be when those conversations come around it's far easier to, to tackle them rugby pun there you go and what about match officials so we spoke about coaches any thoughts on on from yeah, a match official point of view officials. well let's not go Wayne down that <laughs> let's not go down that route and go completely no, off let's, topic let's but... go down that route 
I'll, I'll just Go say quickly then. before David comes in. There's no denying the fact that I got in trouble a lot, eight times significantly in my career, eight times. Now that I look back at it and I've wrote my book and it was quite cathartic, I went through it all, it now makes sense that there's always something. I don't believe I ever had mental health issues as a player, but looking back at it, there was always something happening in my life which led to the brain fart on the field. There was always some sort of altercation off the field, not not so much a drama off the field. I might have been butting heads with the senior coach as a captain over certain issues. I might have had there's plenty of things going on, you know. So it all makes sense now. If only I knew the solution back then. <laughs> and that's why you're here tonight. They're ex sharing your experiences, so hopefully others can yeah. others can learn from it. Keep it and, and David, <laughs> and David, over to you in terms of. Clubs, is there anything they might do differently? So, we, again, you you know, you've given some great ideas around supporting players, but from looking at it in terms of supporting coaches or volunteers or the you know the match officials, is there anything else that they might want to consider? I think I think we've just got to find ways of um, talking to everybody and checking in with everybody. As Dylan said just now, everyone's fighting a battle at some stage. We just don't know what that battle is. I I, I unfortunately. Um, I get called out to organizations when they, they've lost somebody to suicide. And in the last three years, almost without exception, the person who's taken their own life was somebody in that organization who made people laugh every day. They was, it's never been the quiet guy or the quiet girl who sits in the corner. It's always been the larger than life character um, who everyone thought there's no way they'd ever do that to themselves. So you have to check in with everybody. You, you just don't know. When you look at some of the, 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 the high profile personalities, people like um, uh, Robin Williams um, used his humor for years. One of the funniest guys of all time. And yet that was a complete mask to hide what was really going on with his life. Uh, Caroline Flack was a very vivacious, you know, bubbly character. Yes, she was going through some real shit. We know that. But um, you still didn't think she'd go as far as she did. So. Whether, whether it's an official, whether it's a volunteer, we need to find ways within our clubs of um, checking and talking to everybody uh, because you just don't know what is going on in people's lives. You just have no idea what battles people are facing. So however we do it, um, we've just got to be inclusive with, with everyone in our organisation. Uh, thanks, Rachel. Thanks, David. We've, I've got a couple more questions and then I'm going to look to open it up to the to the floor. So there's a few few questions come in so far, but feel free to um, feel free to pop them in the box and then we'll um, we'll come on to those in a minute. Um, and, and based on some of the stuff we've spoken about and hopefully the pe people listening in tonight, you know, we know that many clubs are now setting up their own mental health and well-being initiatives. And, you know, I'm I'm getting some, um, working on some case studies, so getting some in at the moment, and some of them are, are really inspiring. Um, they vary massively. Some have expertise within the club already where they've been able to utilise that expertise to, to develop something that's quite actually quite high level in terms of that support, whereas others, um, you know, they've gone to work with local other local organisations or charities to make sure that there's some connection and some link to, to kind of um, work with uh, players or signpost or provide information. And, you know, wh whatever it is, it's really positive to hear that clubs are, are doing this. Um, and this kind of local kind of club driven approach is, is for me what I think it provides the most impact. So, Dylan, based on that, you know, and um, do you have any learnings from your career or, you know, your experiences and what you're doing now? around how clubs can be kind of really approaching the, the mental health and well-being. And I know we've spoken about a lot already, but is there anything else, any little nuggets you can think of in terms of, you know, getting that buy-in and, and getting people to, to really kind of believe and building that trust, et cetera, some of the other things we've spoken about? Yeah, I think to, to drive awareness and drive vulnerability and to drive conversation, it's all born from trust and relationships. So, you know, as a captain, I would force, I would force my team after a game not to go home i would force them to stay for an hour two hours after a game and, and i know grassroots is slightly different but everyone getting the clubhouse after it's almost you've got to force these things but the, the best teams that i was involved with we did call it a family and we meant it it was a brotherhood we 
we literally looked after each other, looked out for one another. And like I said, the, those, the, the, the roots of that tree, it was deep rooted. People knew each other. They looked out for each other. They communicated that. And that was not without saying we took the piss out of each other as well. It, it was it was a good, safe environment. And I think the only way you can drive that is spending more time together, especially off the field. And I'll tell you what, you get those bonds better off the field, your rugby is only going to get better as well. Teams will gel and perform and work harder and go that extra sort of inch or mile for each other on the field as well. So do you know what? It'd be great for wet sales in the bar. I'll just make sure everyone's, you know, try and put on food. Get on, get food in the clubhouse once a week. Make sure people are, are eating together. Because you know what, we spend so much time on bloody technology and phones and whatnot. When you sit around a table, you look each other in the eye and you, you spend time around food and you bond there. It's um, it's a powerful thing. It's like you know, it's even going to the pub now. People take their phones. Don't believe it. Put the phones in the in, in the kit bag and have food, have a drink, build the relationships. There you and, go. And, and that you know that's kind of more important than ever, really, isn't it? Based on on the last year or so. So yeah, just Am take I just time. Promoting of... beer. I think I'm just promoting alcohol. I'm not promoting alcohol. I'm promoting a drink, a social drink. <laughs> Orange squash is fine. Yeah. <laughs> um, and on that, David, again, any other tips or ideas that you've got for clubs looking to set up some initi initiatives or programmes around this? Firstly, just to support what Dylan said, it's all about relationships and having someone you can talk to in that organisation. And it's that bonding. I was at a very academic institute many years ago and there was a, a Japanese business, the equivalent of Richard Branson in Japan. That's who he was. Can't remember his name. And he was asked to leave all the business leaders in the room with a golden nugget about how to run an incredibly successful organization. And his golden nugget was, um, I've got eight people in my team. I try and speak to all of them at least every other day, but only half of those conversations are about work. So there was a, a, you know, a very successful business person saying, half your conversations at work don't need to be about work. And so bring that back into a rugby club and 50% of the rugby club's um, you know, whole feel about it and culture about it is all the chat in the bar. It's, it's not all the technical stuff at training um, and, and, and the coaching. It's that bonding between people and its relationships. Just in terms of mental health initiatives, I've just been reading some of the stuff in, in the chat function, and it's great to see a number of organisations uh, going down the mental health first data route, which is really good. But, but just one thing to say about that um, is that it's really important we educate people about the role of a mental health first data. They've generally done a couple of days of training. It took me five years to qualify as a counsellor. They're not there as many counsellors. They're there to raise the profile of mental health in that organisation. And they're there if you go to talk to them to signpost to you the right sort of places to get help. So they are great to have in organisations. Um, they're not the same as having a, a mental health professional on board. They're great at raising profile, but they're not many counsellors. They are there to signpost you to go and see a GP or a mental health counsellor or to go to one of the mental health charities. But brilliant to see so many initiatives taking place across rugby, um, raising the, the profile of mental health. Yeah, and just just to reinforce that, and I, you know, that's kind of been our approach from a from a national governing body point of view is we want to help clubs, in, you know, increase awareness to clubs of how they can support their their, their players, their members, their coaches, etc., and share ideas around what some of those initiatives look like. And I'll, I'll come on to that um, more in a bit. But it's knowing what your limitations are, isn't it, within that in terms of let's not try and solve everyone's problem. And I think. You know, the analogy I, I use and um, I think I used it on the last webinar was if someone walked into the clubhouse with a broken leg, you wouldn't try and no. you, you wouldn't try and fix the broken leg. You'd send them off to hospital and it should be the same from yeah. a, a men mental well-being point of view. Yeah. So there's a there's a couple of questions come in um, and quite a few people have asked, you know, and again, we've we have talking generically about players uh, kind of across all ages. But is there anything specific? in terms of working with children and again you know based on what's happened in this last year or so we're probably you know we we're anticipating seeing more issues at younger ages so any any thoughts there david i'll come to you first um i think the earlier we can start making children be aware it's okay not to be okay the better 
um, it took me till I got to my early 50s to finally embrace that phrase and to come out and think, yeah, do you know what? I'm comfortable with my own skin. I'm happy being me. So the earlier we can say to, to, to children, um, you know, talk, talk about your emotions, talk about how you're feeling. That one to 10 would work well with kids. You know, if you ask a kid out, out you know, how he is out of 10, he'll say 100. Um, but it's the day he says 50, not 100. You know, what's wrong, Johnny? You know, you're normally 100. Why are you only 50? You know, 50? Um, so the earlier we can start talking to children about uh, their, you know, how they're feeling emotionally, the better, without a doubt. And, and with young boys, please, let's not, um, you know, try and get them to man up. Let's not let's not say to them, you know, you're a big boy now. Big boys don't cry. That's what girls do, because that's why the suicide rates are so high amongst men and why us men find it really difficult to talk about emotional stuff. We are conditioned throughout our childhood that big boys don't cry. That's what girls do. So please, let's stop that with um, with, with young males um, as, as soon as we can. Um, thank you, Rachel. Yeah, and we've just had, uh, I think it's Lisa Johnson on on the chat, just make a really good point of saying mental health knows no age. And I, yeah, you know, exactly that. But I, And as you've said, though, the more, the earlier we start to talk to them about being open and having those conversations and feeling okay about talking around it, then the better. That proactive is obviously better than having to react. Dylan, any any thoughts on that as a, as a dad as well? Oh, I mean, geez. Else as a parent here, I'm they're teaching me. I'm trying to work it out. I'm on the hoof, but I, I think with anything, um, when you, when you experience a, a culture shift, uh, I think we're experiencing a culture shift right now in terms of mental health, mental health awareness. Um, it might seem like a bit of a new age thing that we're talking about it, but the sooner that these four, five, six year olds get to a twenty one year old to a thirty year old. It's just a shift in, in how we approach people, how we talk to people, and um, it will become part of a part of society. You know, I, I'm not qualified to to talk about that any further, but I just know when you when you have a culture shift um, in these things, it takes time. But the, the younger you can target people, and it will pay dividends, obviously, down the line. So, um, yeah, geez. I don't know. I'm thinking about my kids now. I'm just trying to work them out. It's a mystery, isn't it? It's like a Rubik's cube. I think you spend the, the rest of your life trying to work them out, won't you? Yeah. <laughs> um, again, another, and we've kind of answered some of this already, but I think uh, Kevin Brown makes some really good points. So he says, creating a culture, creating a, a kind of culture, should coaches be encouraged as part of this as their development to create the culture from a young player's age to enable that coach to play a respect and bond. So really kind of, as we've sort of spoken about there and allow, and kind of where does that stand? Where do we stand around allowing the player to input uh, into their kind of rugby, what they do and, and also feeling listened to. Um, and then he also sort of says, you know, what, what can we do in terms of working as coaches to kind of increase that bond and work on that bond within, within a coaching scenario. And when you're working with the players, Um, I th I th again, I think David, you'd be better qualified to, to answer this, but I think rugby teaches you so many good values. It's taught me so many good values. And again, being a team sport, often with coaches that are volunteering their time, it's a collaborative process. So the training session, the team is effectively theirs. It's not owned by the coach or the dad or the whoever's coaching or even Eddie Jones did not own the team. It was my team. It was our team. So we chose what effectively we wanted to do. We we set our own standards of how we wanted to operate as a team on and off the field. But um, I think the thing I'm trying to get to is that rugby teaches us so many things. So when you're hurt, you get up and you keep going. But that is one of, for me, one of the key things of rugby. Your team are relying on you. And I think I might get kicked off the call here in a second. Um, but like saying, you know, are you hurt? Are you okay? It's all right. Sit this out. The, the flip side of the argument is, you know, dust down your knees and get back in with the team. That taught me so many lessons. So I don't know, David, how you, you approach that sort of thing, being sensitive to, to kids, how they're physically feeling and tying that to an emotional feeling and basically not saying man up, but, one of rugby's values, in my opinion, is go on, get on with it, kid, 
girl, boy, it, it's, you know, get in there, carry on. So I don't know how you approach that sort of situation. I was just going to say, before I hand over to David, I think, you know, it's that resilience piece, isn't it? It's about helping them build resilience as well, you know. So, yeah, go on, David, over to you, really. What, what are your thoughts I, I on think that? You are, that's a tough question because it's such a balance, isn't it? I can see how rugby can toughen up your resilience and your resilience is your mental stamina. And we all need mental stamina. So I can see why rugby is fantastic for your mental health. Um, and there's a big difference between helping people build mental resilience than just saying, you know, big boys don't cry, you know, hide your emotions. But, but it's a fine line. And that's why parent, it started right at the beginning this evening. Why bloody parenting is so difficult. You know, that difference between tough love and, and being quite soft and cuddly. And we all know there's times for tough love. There's times to be soft and cuddly and there's there's times when I guess it's somewhere in the middle um, and rugby can play a part in, in all of that. Um, in rugby clubs, if they've got the right values and the right culture, it can be a fantastic place to bring children up. Um, you know, just we know in the world of football now, you've got young, young players encouraged to almost feign injury. If they get the slightest knock, they're screaming on the ground. And that encouraged. can be good. They're trained. They do they're drills. Trained to it. Absolutely. They are, and you know, we never want that in rugby. You know, we want far better values in rugby. And I, you know, it's uh, if if I if I was a parent of young kids now, I'd, I'd want my kids in a, in a good rugby club because I can see the value that would bring them um, in so many different ways. Uh, would would be great. Thank you, Rachel. <laughs> And I think, yeah, thanks, David. And you made a really good point, that, that kind of tough love point, and you spoke about parenting, but I think that just translates perfectly to a coach as well, you know, having coached kids myself and been on watch, you know, watch kids being coached um, and having been coached, you know, um, as, as a youngster as well. Never underestimate the significance you will have in that, you know, in that young person's life as a coach. You know, you will be, they will look up to you. You are a role model to them. So, being being able to kind of find that and it is sometimes a fine line around that you know helping them develop their and build their resilience but also recognizing actually there's something wrong you know i need to kind of address this slightly differently and it might be actually this time it's a you know let's have a chat rather than get up and carry on kind of thing and it's it is it is a fine line but you know i think as you've sort of said there within a rugby club coaches have a real important role to play in that because Especially if you, you know, you pick, you start with a team at under sevens and you might go up with them to, you know, all the way up to under 17s. You, you've been a massive part of their life for, for 70, uh, for 10 years. And um, you, you play a big part in that. Who was your, who was your role model growing up, Dylan? Did it's you funny you say that because when, when I look back, you know, Johnny McGregor, who's my mate's dad, used to drive me to training, you know, under 10s rugby. And then Craig Burrell, my under 15s, um, teacher and and coach and do you know what these they're just normal guys when i look back at it these are just dads of guys in the team but they were inspirational figures a guy called jerry cowley like my under 12s coach they're all volunteers but inspirational figures to me at the time and imprinted and left great things on me you know and i look back now and it does actually the pennies just drop next time i coach kids oh, i've got to think about that responsibility i suppose of of what sort of um, you know footprint I'm leaving on on their rugby experience, so um, I don't have the uh, the I don't know I don't know what it is. I can't commit to a team just yet until my kids start playing full time. I don't think I'm going to commit to a full time coaching role. But um, no, it's a, it's a very valid point. You know, simple you know simple guy has left massive kind of footprints on on my um, outlook on on not just the game but just who I am as a person. And, and just on that, and it might be hard, I don't know whether you can articulate it, but what is it that made them inspirational? What is it that has, has left that, that imprint on you? I think um, looking back and appreciation of, of time, uh, I was a rural kid, so I had to travel a long way and we all had to travel a long way to train. So I always had a great appreciation of people just turning up to make up numbers. When you know, I was part of that, we committed to the team and without me turning up or them turning up or the dads turning up, we didn't have rugby so just an appreciation for people's time but I remember one guy I was, I was 12 years old Jerry Cowley he made us sign contracts 
So I was professional at 12, basically. But <laughs> the contract was committing to the team, putting the team first above, you know, whether it was too cold, too wet, you know, you had a birthday party to go to. It didn't matter. If you signed up for Kahukura under 12s at the time, you signed the contract, which meant you were going to turn up Tuesday, Thursday. And I genuinely looked through my whole professional rugby career. I didn't miss a thing. I put the team first with everything. Socially, I was selfish. My, my family suffered. My, my poor wife suffered. Um, christenings, weddings, all these things. I, I put I put the team first. So I think just that early installation of, you know, rugby is a team game. The team comes first. For for me, those sort of values carried carried through from from twelve years old. And I know of um, I've spoken with people in clubs who do similar things around that that contract, and it might not be quite in the same vein as as, as you've described there, but that the idea of getting you know ten year old kids to kind of commit to or, or sign up to the values of rugby and what's part of that and that resilience of that teamwork and all those things are part of that. But also, you know, thinking about it now, one of the things you could put in there is also you know that realizing and feeling safe to say you're not okay and all those kind of things so David any any other thoughts as we've kind of diverted a little bit but it's, it's positive do you know what just on, on a really positive note um you guys are from the rugby world and it's really shown me tonight how brilliant rugby is for your mental health I've been reading some of the comments in 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 the chat from Kelly mm. and, and and Lisa and um you know one of the best things you can do for your kids is put them in a rugby club. Um, you know, I get I get so frustrated and embarrassed about the lack of resources uh, available for mental health. Uh, um, someone spoke about, you know, lack of resource in Cornwall. Trust me, there's a lack of resource all around the UK. And one of the best things you can do for your kids' mental health or young adults' mental health is join a rugby club. You know, be, the rugby community should be proud of itself for the values and, and everything it teaches you about life. So if you get into the right rugby club with the right coaches, with the right culture, it's one of the best things you can do for people's mental health. So, um, yeah, I, I just, as I say, generally being really positive. I work with many diverse organizations and types of businesses. And I'm sitting here tonight thinking one of the best things I can recommend people as a mental health expert is to join a rugby club because I think it's really, really good for your well-being. Thanks, David. That's a, definitely a good a good plug. And, you know, likewise, I've been reading some of the, the, the comments on the chat and it's really great to hear of, of some of the, the work that's going on. And it's it's good to hear from yourself, David, that, you know, having worked across such a, a wide range of organisations and, and industries that, you know, there's there is something around rugby, rugby that makes it special. Yeah. Um, and on that note, we've got a few minutes left. So, Dylan, just before we kind of wrap up, just any kind of other final thoughts from from yourself? No, I just think um, picking up on what David said uh, is, is the game's all about winning and losing. And I'm not talking about Saturday. Obviously, that's the, the big up or the big down. You know, that, that's why we play the game or, or lots of us do. But the game is, is full or training is filled with feedback. Like you're constantly winning or you're losing. You catch a ball, you drop a ball, you tackle, you miss a tackle, you miss a ruck, you get penalised, you get on side with the ref. You're constantly getting feedback. And Again, David, for, for kids especially, you know, you're instilling learning and resilience on the hoof. Mm -hmm. So you, you've been told to get back 10 metres and then you miss a tackle. It's like double negative and then you've got to go get a positive. And as long as you're that coach kind of encouraging that next positive uh, step or involvement mm -hmm. in, in the game, I, I just think remember that the game is constantly teaching the kids about resilience, setbacks, working hard together, working towards a common goal. Um, you know, I, I'm a, an ambassador for rugby. I, I love the game. You know what I mean? It's easy to say. But when, when you strip it back, there's so many teachings and learnings there for our kids, which will grow into healthier uh, adults. So I, agree. I don't know. Why, why are we even plugging rugby? Everyone on here is rugby people. It's like we're not pitching to footballers, are we? Is it is it the Kiwis who say better players make better people? Is that their... Uh... It's a people make better better pe uh, players you can flip it you can you can do it either way i guess as well but yeah it's it is a really good point isn't it so but, uh, just one last thing and, and david picked up on it is you know the, the kind of code of conduct or the unspoken rule of rugby is you know from from a, a male point of view 
we were we were brothers off the off the pitch and we were brothers on the pitch so that almost kind of when you sign that code of conduct whether you do or you don't you're signing up to turning up to training you're signing up to looking after your mates off the field uh and on the field so i think that you know where we're going with the awareness piece of, of mental health or mental skills is people aren't just going to look out for each other in the the obvious aspect of on the field or off the field in terms of getting into trouble potentially down at the pub or whatever, or, or on the field in, in a bit of a scuffle, they'll start looking out for each other uh, in a mental capacity and, you know, in a lifestyle capacity for uh, off the field as well. So do you know what? Um, I think we're headed in the right direction. Um, yeah, positive. Don't know what else to say. No, thanks, Dylan. And, and, you know, just to say, I guess, from a from a woman's point of view, having played rugby for 20 plus years, it's the same, you know, it's that sisterhood that makes it so special and, yeah, on and off the pitch. I've I've not, not played for a couple of years now, but I still have such great friends from the game and always will. So there's, you know, there's there's such a powerful, powerful message in that. David, just just over to you then, just to kind of, I guess, in terms of a few quick questions around signposting and 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 sort of follow-up and support. So I, I guess this is the reaction bit, really. But if there is, and we've covered some of it already, but um I'm gonna talk about some of the resources available in a second, but if there was a club who had serious concerns about an individual, what what should they do? Um, you start with a GP, just like you would with a physical health issue. I know some GPs don't handle mental health particularly fantastically, but you still start with your GP. And we've got to start thinking more about mental health in the way we think about physical health. There are some fantastic mental health charities out there like mine and other great organisations like the Samaritans. And there's, you know, these days, if you Google, you can, there are some brilliant organizations offering support. But you start with your GP, Rachel, just like you would with a physical health issue. The biggest diff the danger is, is that with a physical health issue, because it bloody hurts straight away, you tend to go within 24, 48 hours. When it comes to mental well-being, we tend to put things off, put things off, put things off. It's about getting, you know, going quicker. Um, I don't know if you've heard the frog analogy, but if you drop a frog in a boiling pot of water, he uh, it lives every single time. If you put a frog in a cold pot of water and put him on the lowest temperature on the hob, he slowly boils to death because he doesn't realise the water's heating up. He leaves it too late to get out and he and he ends up uh, boiling to death. Well, that that's like burnout. Um, you know, fro frogs are in intelligent animals. If they knew they were slowly cooking, guess what? They jump out. Everyone watching me tonight and watching us is, is intelligent, but we tend to leave things too late when it comes to mental health. So don't end up like a bloody frog. You know, if you're not feeling great about your mental well-being, take action earlier on and, and go and see a professional. It, it's really, really important. Um, so, uh, yeah. I, but just again, Rachel, I'm going to say it one more time. You're talking about where would I recommend people to go for their mental health? Um, I'm going to be going home tonight thinking a rugby club so much positive has come out of tonight um i'm i've got a real feel good factor tonight this as you know when we were planning tonight we didn't design it so we ended up talking about this stuff we're talking about now it's naturally led to this conclusion um dylan you know the rugby legend me me, me a mental health expert and yourself with 20 you know 25 years in rugby and we've all reached the same bloody conclusion Rugby is really good for your mental well-being. There you go. Yeah, yeah. Thanks, David. And and I think that point you sort of said there around, um, you know, not not burning out. And I, you know, the more awareness we can create it for, you know, clubs. And from a club point of view, even if it is that first step in just raising awareness, it's it's a positive step, definitely. Yeah. And just just one more in terms of, I guess, you know that. If if a player came and dis if I was a coach and a player came and disclosed something to me and sort of said please don't tell anyone, what what do I need to do? So if they disclose something, what's my position? The first thing you say to anyone if they say, look, this is going to be between you and me, you don't agree to that uh, because you don't know what they're going to tell you, and you've got a duty of care to yourself and you've got a duty of care to that person. Sometime to seek the right sort of uh, advice about what to do. If someone does come up to you about mental health, what you do is you say to them, thank you. Thank you so much for coming to talk to me. I know this can't have been easy. 
you do your best to listen non-judgmentally, sensitively, empathically. And then at some point you say to them, um, look, thanks again for coming to talk to me. I really care about you, but I'm not qualified to deal with this. Now, what we need to do together is to get you the right sort of support. And you sit down with them and you do everything possible to encourage them to seek the right sort of professional support. And then very importantly, Rachel, you don't leave it at that. You agree when you're next going to check in with each other. It might be the following day. It might be a week later. But you say to that person, look, I do really care. So let's grab a coffee again in a few days time because I want to make sure you've been able to get the right sort of support to get you to a better place. So you stay with them on the journey until you know that, that, that they're OK. So don't put yourself under pressure to fix people. However, create a relationship where they feel they can trust you and talk to you. When they talk to you, listen sensitively, empathically, non-judgmentally, signpost what they need to do and then stay with them on the journey, making sure they're talking to the right people. That's the key thing to do, Rich. Thanks, David. That's really, uh, again, really insightful and just some simple things that hopefully clubs can, clubs can take away from tonight.